precious God. So we bless you. And we sense that we are on uh, at a threshold, Lord. We've not been this way here too far. There, there's something that you're wanting to impart, to express, to bring your church to a, a new sense of awareness, of consciousness, uh, in what is preparation for our ultimate call to be the saviors of Israel in the last day, so to speak. And it requires, my God, an extraordinary empathy uh, toward this people who will not be in their best frame. Everything that would be calculated to rub us raw and to make us to recoil from them, they themselves will bear in their distress. So we know, my God, that the issue is not them, it's us. What, what we will be in that hour, how we will receive them, how we will respond, what they will see in us will be not only the, the issue of their survival, but the issue of their salvation. That among them there will be a remnant that will return to Zion with everlasting joy upon their heads and mourning and sighing fleeing away. That they will say that their whole final exile and being out the outcasts of <coughs> Judah And the castaway of Israel was worthwhile. Like the blind beggar, it was worthwhile they had regained their sight to follow you. So, my God, work with us, work in us, and bring forth in this precious congregation what you will. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of this time. Again, we confess we don't know how to proceed. You overrule anything, Lord, that I thought to employ and uh, have your precious way as the Lord over all. Our ears are tuned to hear, Lord, what you're saying. Speak for your servants are hearing. And we thank and give you praise again for our privilege and our call. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I'm going to read some Lord willing something from the messages given at Canada that began by a statement that after 38 years in the faith I am persuaded that anti-Jewishness is intrinsic to all Gentiles that there's a latent anti-Semitism resident in all Gentiles it's just the name of the game it's the very nature of the, of the truth of what it means to be a Gentile and to have uh, in our midst a people of a kind that are um, that chafe us and uh, are different and, ex and ex ex excite every kind of re reaction toward them being different from them and other it's the name of the game, it's intrinsic, it's built into reality itself and the only thing that can alter that is the grace of God the spirit of God the converting power of God, the sanctifying work of God, where that work is yet incomplete or partial or has been resisted, even in believers, even in spirit-filled believers, something of this latent disposition against the Jew remains. And many of us would be shocked to be accused of, uh, of either being anti-Semitic or even having the potential, because we're not conscious of any rage or or inflammatory thing, we would never say anything that is indecent, but there are other ways in which this disposition is expressed. And until it's met in full, we cannot be to them what we ought, nor can we be a bride to the bridegroom. The two issues are one, and may the Lord show us that, and that in fact that it's even the Jew in God's provision for us to obtain our status as a bride to the bridegroom. I want to flat out say that I'm coming to the conclusion, and I'll probably be sharing it in these days, that the Jew is God's provision for our ultimate sanctification. Amen. That there's no way that we could have attained to a bridal nature adorned for the bridegroom, independent of the work, uh, uh, the, the sanctifying work that comes to us in that relationship with this most, what's the word? most something people, most fill it in, inflammatory, most provocative, most abusive, most 
Irritating. Offensive. Most arrogant. Abrasive. Huh? Abrasive. Abrasive. Irritating. Yeah. They are that condition for our sake. They are the enemies of the gospel, Paul says, for your sake. Have you ever pondered that? Who needs an enemy like that? They are an ultimate enemy, as you can only know when you seek to confront them with the gospel. If you have avoided that mandate, which is a first mandate to the Jew first, and then to the uh, Greek, you don't know the radical character of the gospel itself until you see men foaming at the mouth with indignation and rage and your audacity to presume to say to them that they need, quote, to be saved. Saved from what? They're not even conscious of their sin. They see themselves as exemplary, and by every human measure they are. Didn't they win the B'nai B'rith Man of the Year Award? <laughs> and haven't they contributed philanthropies not only to Israel but to Gentile causes? Didn't the head of a big publishing firm in San Francisco, when I went up to his tower office in the hotel which he owns, want to uh, bribe me and say, what, what do you want? You know, how can I... You, you want a contribution to your ministry? Is that what, you, what you're angling for? I said, no. I only want to tell you that your philanthropy is not going to earn you an eternal place in God. There's everything about them calculated for us. And they don't even know that. It's like the wife who has to suffer living with a prophetic man who happens also to be Jewish, not realizing that that suffering is intrinsic to the differences between us and has to be born, even though being a Gentile, she doesn't understand the prophetic wisdom of it. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. That's the mystery of Israel and the church. Let me read how difficult the relationship with the Jew is. Uh, you can read Michael Brown's book on Their Blood is on Our Hands. That's a classic survey of all of the miscarriage of justice, of uh, murder, mayhem, bloodshed, forced conversions, the, of which the church today has little consciousness. And even if Jews do not know the particulars of that history, they know the substance of it, and they still carry it generation by generation. The cross, the name Christ, the very appearance of a church, I often say, a Jew will avoid allowing the shadow of the spire of a church even to fall upon him. Mm. You know that there's some Orthodox Jews who will spit when in passing a church because what is represented by that cross is not the statement of atonement, but the statement of mayhem, persecution, and murder. That's what the Crusaders had on their chest, uh, and the so-called uh, Christians of the pogroms of the Ukraine and Russia, the seasons of persecution, have always been identified with that which is called Christian. In a word, we have every card stacked against us. What we are called to break through into a new quality of relationship with this people, for our sake and for their sake, well, everything is stacked against us historically and in their understanding, as will be expressed in this quote, of those who want no dealings with Christians at all. And Rabbi Eliezer Berkowitz, whose name I know, an outstanding theologian, Jewish theologian, very respected, orthodox, says, what was started at the Council of Nicaea, that was under Constantine, in which the rudiments of the faith were clarified and elaborated, was duly completed in the concentration camps and crematoria. At this stage, he said, it would be as immoral as it would be emotionally impossible for a sensitive, historically conscious Jew to have anything to do with Christians at all. All we want of you Christians is that you keep your hands off of us and our children. <laughs> if that doesn't let the air out of your balloon, I don't know what will. And the writer says, These words are hard to hear and hard to bear, but hear and bear them we must, for I think for some time to come. 
So history has done a number that will be enormously difficult to overcome. Here's another statement by Rabbi Ab Abraham Herschel, whose two volumes on the prophets are classic, and whom I had the privilege to meet years ago when I was being trained in New York City as a missionary to the Jews. Probably one of the most, if I should say, sympathetic to Christ of any of the uh, significant Jewish voices. He's now passed on. He said, I had rather enter Auschwitz than be an object of conversion. I've heard Jewish mothers say to me, I'd rather see my son go to hell as a drug addict than he should subscribe to your faith. There's, there's no way to plumb the depth of the animosity against the faith that is dear to us and repulsive to them. Wow. It's going to take an extraordinary stroke from God, and not just a one-time thing, a remarkable dealing of God with us to fit us somehow, despite <laughs> all of the historic and present difficulties, to establish even a minimal line of communication. Maybe we will be helped by the fact that as anti-Semitism becomes increasingly prevalent throughout the world, Jews will be so desperate for any kind of ally that they're willing even to consider us in our friendship. <laughs> but we'll have to show ourselves friendly and uh, not, a, not in any way inadvertently be clumsy and express something that will immediately trigger a reaction against us. So it's a real measure of the grace of God with us and in us. And for that reason, we're afraid to enter their synagogues. We're afraid to establish contact. We don't know how to speak to them. We're walking on eggshells. And more than a Jew being turned off by anything that issues from Christians, are you saved, brother? They, are, they will be more turned off by what is obsequious and condescending toward them. Excuse my language. That which is uh, stilted and making nice. Oh, I've always loved Jews. And Jews are my... I, I have a Jew who's my best friend. And blah, 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 blah. that is really icky. It turns them off more than just a blunt anti-Semitic statement. They, they would have more ability and patience to hear a man who's true in his prejudice than to hear someone condescending and making nice. Well, Art, then how do we strike the balance? How, how do we deport ourselves? Well, there's no rule. There's no way how to. It's the, it's, it's the truth of what you are in Christ that's at stake. For he has made unto us wisdom, sanctification, redemption, and power, and you've never been tested on the truth of that in the ultimate test that the Jew represents. And that's why we're slack. So I'm encouraging the church to make its contact with the Jews of its own locality who are positioned there for our sake. The Lord has seen to their wide distribution in the judgment that has come to them that has cast them into all nations and will increasingly cast them. But they're there where we are, that we will be tested to see if we are taking the Lord seriously in the mandate that has come to the church to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And because we have voided that mandate and have avoided that people knowing that they constitute such an ultimate challenge to us, we have not been to the Greeks what we ought. Well, had we gone to the Jew first, of necessity, we would have had to learn what Paul knew, that this gospel is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first, the message itself does not commend it intellectually. It is not respectable, it is not rational, it is absurd actually, it's a piece of foolishness and it's a calculated piece of foolishness that God has laid aside his deity, come down to earth as an infant, totally dependent, doing doo-doo in his diapers uh, like, like us, to, to take upon the humiliation of a human form and to live 30 years in obscurity and have a shot in the pan three and a half year public ministry that will end with his uh, excruciating death as a criminal outside uh, of the city in the, in, the, in the 
in the garbage dump between criminals, and that's, that's our Messiah, our King. Rightly was he mocked in three languages with the sign over his head, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, ha, ha, ha. And taunted and mocked even in his suffering unto death. This is so despicable. This is so outlandish. This is so uncommendable. How do you dare have the presumption and the arrogance to come to a Jew with that message whose moral life is more exemplary than your own? And whose English and education and erudition is more impressive than your own? You're going to come to him with your high school dropout English and your inadequate spirituality and bring a message of that kind? It's suicide. It's, inti it's intimidation. It's mortification. And for that reason, we have resisted it. But you know what we have signaled to the powers of the air overhead? These people say, Lord, Lord, and their choruses are full of uh, ador adoring phrases with regard to Jesus the Lord. But when, when the rubber hits the road and the Lord gives a mandate to the Jew first, we have not obeyed it. That's why the powers of the air say, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? We're not obliged in any way to take you seriously, so long as we see that the language of the faith is only a, a, a phraseological thing, because when it comes to the issue of actual obedience to the Lord, you have failed. And you continue to fail, and you're not even at all in any way distressed over that failure. So how should we take you seriously? See, there's, there's a great drama, you guys. This is cosmic, and the Jew is at the heart of it. And the Lord in his wisdom has established the whole thing. Have the faith of the Son of God, for he believes and knows that he will yet prevail, even with a church of the kind that we are. Can you believe? In fact, he must prevail with the kind of church that we are, for that itself is the wisdom of God that is contrary to the wisdom of the powers of the air. For out of the mouths of babes and sucklings has he perfected praise. It must come out of the makeshift, motley, nothing uh, composition that the church is, that is not prestigious as the Jewish community is, that is not as learned, that is not as powerful, that is not as wealthy, that, that the triumph of Christ must come as it was displayed at the cross <coughs> in foolishness and in weakness. There's a drama, you guys. I don't have a word for it. A saga. It's an immense overwhelming thing and it ends the age when, when that foolish thing in which God has trusted and given his spirit and his word and his ministers, his prophets and his apostles, his evangelists pastors and teachers, that they will be brought to the place of an obedience and a fulfillment by which Israel shall be redeemed and the church transfigured and to be raised up in a glorified body uh, to be with its Lord as bride to the bridegroom and uh, everlasting righteousness in a new heaven and a new earth. Well, to contrast the two Jews that I've just read, where a man would rather go to Auschwitz than to be converted. And imagine I was brought up to meet that man. I don't, I don't know that I even said boo. Precious, weighty, prestigious man, scholar. You, you read the prophets and see if you can follow him in Greek and Latin and French and German and all of the quotes in, that he cites, the breadth of his understanding is, is astonishing, as well as his insight into the prophetic phenomenon itself. So I was a piece of foolishness against a Jew who represents what Jews themselves celebrate the wisdom of this world. Here's a statement by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Everybody know who he is? Was? Who died a week before the end of World War II, hung by the Nazis for his collaboration with a plot to assassinate Hitler, who could have remained in New York or in London or other places of safety, but came back to Germany because he felt that unless he was with his own nation and church in that nation in the time of ultimate Nazi peril, how can he be to that nation after the war what he might? But he never made it. But what he wrote and what he, what he learned in those days 
is one of the great contributions to the church. If you've not read the book, Life Together, it's a classic that must be in every believer's library, and more on the library, right on their nightstand, and continually being read and internalized and walked out. Here's what he wrote when he was in a prison cell in 1943 before his death. My thoughts and feelings seem to be getting more and more like the Hebrew Scriptures. And no wonder I have been reading it much more than the new for the last few months. It is only when one knows the ineffability of the name of God. Ineffable means cannot be spoken. That one can utter the name of Jesus Christ. A remarkable statement for a German Christian. So much in keeping with my own painful early time as a newly saved Jewish man in my Pentecostal assembly in California, hearing the name of Jesus on everyone's lips. Jesus, 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 Lord. Oh, no, no, no. I had not come out of, an, of a, out of an Orthodox background that refuses even to spell the word God, G-O-D, but omits the O and puts a hyphen as a statement of respect for God. That's why the Orthodox use the word Hashem, the name, because you don't speak the name, you just refer to the name. Only the high priest, once in the year on Yom Kippur, could speak the name, known only to him by mystery and revelation, when he made atonement for the sins of Israel. <coughs> Otherwise, who knows how to say yod heh vav -Hey, the four consonants mm -hmm. called the Tetragrammaton. It could be pronounced as Yahweh, Jehovah. What is the authentic st pronunciation? I don't know. And they don't know, and in a certain sense, they don't think it's even rightful to know or to probe beyond what God himself will reveal. Mm -hmm. But we Christians, Jesus, Jesus, Lord, Lord, yeah, and God, God, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what is he saying here? He finds himself in his prison cell. I don't think that that should be ignored. There's something about prison cells waiting execution that prepares a soul for a depth of understanding of God, of eternity, and of ultimate issues of truth and reality that nothing else will provide. There's not been a Christian who has ever been put into a cell who has not received the benefit. You have only to read Richard Wombrandt's testimony that he cherishes his 13 years in solitary confinement. He would not exchange it for anything, for the revelation that came to him in that place where he was cut off even from daylight and for communion and fellowship with human beings, that he received at that time such a sense of the Lord as the Lord, uh, for which there could be no price. And he, and he and not at all sees him, does not see himself as a victim, but as a privileged man for that experience. And everything that issued from him after that has continued to bless the church. So here's another soon-to-be martyr, Speaking out of his prison cell in 1943, my thoughts and feelings seem to be getting more and more like the Hebrew Scriptures. I have been reading it much more than the New for the last few months, and he was a New Testament scholar. It is only when one knows the ineffability of the name of God, when you know that it cannot be uttered, it's too holy to take to your lips, that one can utter the name of Jesus Christ. Don't utter, don't, don't, don't merchandise in that name as if it's a reflex action and you can speak it at will unless you have first experienced the sense of the ineffability of the name of God. The one tempers the other. The Old Testament exposure tempers your understanding of the new. But to, to, to avoid the Old Testament is to leave yourself crippled in the appreciation of the new. So there's a remarkable... There's something about anything that... Or cracking gun. It is only when one loves life and the earth so much that without them everything would be gone that one can believe in the resurrection and a new world. That's a remarkable mm -hmm. statement. Here's a man imprisoned, facing impending death, when one loves life and the earth. Have you noticed in the Old Testament and in the Psalms the remarkable and frequent references to God as creator? Mm -hmm. I always wondered, why is that always being put before us in the Psalms? 
We're always being reminded of God as creator, of the heavens and the earth, and all that in them is. is part of the great sense of the majesty and the splendor of God that is breathed out of the, of the Old Testament scriptures that does not have as much place in the new, because the new serves other purposes. The new presumes that you are uh, as uh, familiar with the old, and therefore it's not a competition or a rivalry, but there's a certain breadth of the grandeur of God that is given to us in the Psalms and in, uh, and in the prophets and other places, even in the law itself of Moses, that is not to be found in the new. But God forbid that you should have neglected that and come to the new as if the, the, the original is passé, and you can get everything that you need out of the new exclusively. It's one unbroken continuum, and it needs to be understood. And that's what he's seeing in the prison cell. It's the sense of God as creator, the whole majesty of the earth, and, and the significance of life, the sacrament of life, the holiness of life, that I can believe in resurrection and a new world. Did he not believe it before? Being a New Testament scholar and a pastor, and of course he believed it, but the depth of that belief has been enhanced by his prison experience, in which he finds that there's a solace and a comfort and an impartation of a certain kind that is coming to him now increasingly out of the Old Testament. So here it is side by side in the same book, Dietrich Bonhoeffer saying that, and the Jewish commentators saying quite the opposite. And somehow we, we are sus suspended betwixt and between. Well, let me try to summarize what the Lord gave me to begin in Canada. The third message I'll, that concluded, that was so controversial, I'll say for the end. But let me, let me give it to you as it began. Remembering that the Lord had given me the experience of visiting a synagogue in Spokane, and what, a, what an experience that was. I, want, I don't know that I can call it holy, but it was a sense of Jewish life, Jewish community, Jewish respect, uh, Jewish feast days. Um, <coughs> something that uh, we lack in our own experience, and, and uh, I covet it that we would have photographs on, on our hall, hallway walls that show the unbroken continuum of our faith and our relationships of people who have stayed together and uh, that their children are not only bar mitzvah there, they're subsequently married there. If it goes on long enough, they'll yet be buried. There, there's, you, you need to go to Brooklyn and visit the Hasidim, the, the Lubavitcher Hasidim, the ultra-Orthodox, who have moved out from their Long Island dwellings and other places of luxury and comfort to move into a black ghetto. Why? Because that's where their synagogue is, and you can only walk to the synagogue on the Shabbat, you cannot drive. To drive would be to work. And in fact, if even the walk is too long, you have somehow violated the Shabbat. I'm not saying that to endorse such views. I'm, I'm saying that to show the mentality of these people who are willing to sacrifice a life of comfort and seclusion in the suburbs to come into a ghetto. Why? Because there are available the brownstone houses and dilapidated tenement buildings that are cheap and, and can be bought. Because for them, the issue of proximity to each other, and the place of worship is more important than suburban comfort. Mm -hmm. That puts us to shame. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, my sharing about community and the privilege of morning prayer times, which for me are more dear than I can say that if I travel, the thing that I miss most are the morning prayer times. Mm -hmm. No two have ever been alike. Always choice, always something from the Lord, mm -hmm. always precious. And a brother would come after, up to me after and say, Art, I really delight, I, I would love to enjoy what you're describing, but I live so far out that there's no way that I could meet with believers with whom I'm joined on Sunday for a morning prayer time. What do you recommend, Art? Move. <laughs> Give up your little nest. What's, your, what's the more important value? Your, your suburban lifestyle or proximity to the saints? 
that you can be in the place of prayer daily. These Jews put us to shame in, in that kind of zeal that, that accounts for the sacrifice. Something to pray about. The Lord has given me a 30-year relationship and a history. I've been in that community in and out. In fact, I had a previous invitation to, to spend three months with them that never materialized, but it's still a live option. So pray for that as they're in Brooklyn also, that the Lord will call for that. Okay, now I'm coming from this. The Lord's stirring my heart about the synagogue, the Jewish life, what is represented there, and it's isolation from, from the church and from Christians. And my first statement that I make to this conference in Canada is anti-Jewishness is intrinsic to all Gentiles by the very nature of things. You need to recognize that in your deeps, unless the sanctifying work of God at the cross has met it, it's latent and there. In fact, by the end, what was latent surfaced. And so, I mean, this is a kind of lecture which, of which I was accused of lacking anointing and the deeper circumcision of the heart because I'm giving reasons why it is that it's in the nature of all things that Gentiles would harbor, have as intrinsic an anti-Jewishness because Jews themselves are exclusive and we are always offended by those who are separate from ourselves and want to maintain that separation. It makes you question about yourself. Why, what do they find offensive in us? Right away, the, the, your, your fur is up. Jewish exclusiveness, of course, came out of being separate and come out from the Canaanite culture, civilization, and religion and keep kosher. <clears throat> Keep a sanctity, keep, be separate. What God wanted to maintain in the integrity of Israel, hardened into a kind of system officiated over by rabbis and elaborated in a rabbinical way to become an isolation from the Gentile world rather than a, a, a witness. So much so that Peter himself would never have responded to the invitation from that uh, Roman... Cornelius. Cornelius, except he first had a vision. He had to have a, uh, what was it, a, it was more than a dream, it was a, a trance, in which he saw a sheet coming down with unclean animals, and God saying, uh, Peter, take and eat. But Lord, you know that I've never eaten anything unclean. The, the problem for those who wanted to hasten the execution of Jesus was the requirement to come into the court of Gentiles where Pontius Pilate presided and not be themselves, desecrate themselves before the holiday of the Passover. Amen? They were fastidious to keep themselves inviolate from, from coming into the presence of a Gentile in order to affect Jesus' death, but did not think that the death itself was a violation. So much for pharisaical, not just pharisaical Judaism, but pharisaical religion. So Jewish exclusiveness, Gentile envy, imagined or real, the social, cultural, and economic superiority of Jews that is visible works as a factor to inculcate a kind of antipathy toward Jews. Who of us can sit in a classroom uh, with some Jewish students who get straight A's without a bead of sweat, and we're breaking our heads to pass. What is it? What do they have? If you can bless them in their success, you're a superb saint. Uh, otherwise, you'll resent their success. And whether you're conscious of that or not, there's something uh, that has taken place in the course of time that works to give us a disposition against them. We need to recognize these things. And that's why the Lord had me to state them. They represent or depict the imagined wrathful God of the Old Testament as a God of judgment to be feared, and Israel 
as the rod of God unto annihilation of the Canaanites. I don't know if you've ever thought that. This has been an offense to um, even German theologians and uh, who's the one uh, German philosopher, I think he died as a suicide, who was anti-Jewish. Somebody help me. Who? Nietzsche. 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 Uh, hated the Old Testament. Did dislike Paul. And he thought that even Christianity was too Judaic because it entreated believers to the walk of humility uh, 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 rather than an assertion of our manhood in a heroic way. His model was Greek, not Hebraic and was offended even by a Christianity that seemed to suggest a Hebrew influence. But these men, in reading the Old Testament, reading how God used Israel out of slavery and out of its 40 years in the wilderness to excise out <coughs> these Canaanite civilizations and leave not a man, woman, or child, and to actually extinguish these corrupt civilizations, strikes a note of fear that these Jews are still with us and have the same enmity now for us as they had once carried against uh, the, the Gentiles of Canaan. And they may seem to be acting civilly, that's only because they're weak and because they're in the minority, but given the opportunity, they would say to us, off with their heads. <laughs> now that may be more real than imagined, but at any rate, it's a fear and a, a negative note that keeps Gentiles uh, looking at Jews with a degree of suspicion, apprehension, and fear, just from the Old Testament text. Even though the present-day Jew had, has no correspondence to that at all, it's a factor that needs to be recognized. And if uh, the Jewish superiority over the Gentile, the word goyim, which means G-O-Y-I-M, literally the Hebrew for nations, any nation other than Israel are the nations of the Goyim. But when it's spoken by a Jew, there's a little tincture, if not little, of contempt and disdain. There's a sense of Jewish superiority that uh, we have exhibited that rubs uh, the Gentile the wrong way. The rejection of Christ, 2,000 years later, still rejecting Christ, and Christianity raises the question of whether or not they are right in that rejection, and maybe we are wrong. Their continued resistance to the truth of our faith raises questions as to the absoluteness of that faith. Can we have that confidence? How is it that they have been able to live that long and survive, yet being in unbelief and in Christ's rejection and, and prospering? Mm. Doesn't that raise a question that, well, maybe we got it wrong? Mm. And I want to tell you that from my experience at a Lutheran seminary, this is now being openly expressed that the Jews may have it right, and we need to consider whether, in fact, Christ really is the Messiah, because, as they say, if he came, where's the world peace that Messiah should have brought? Mm. We know that those questions can be answered, but they are troubling questions, and for the, those that are weak in their faith or only nominal Christians, it can rattle their cage and make them uh, resistant and hostile to a Jews who seem to live quite successfully without our Christ. It raises the question of the truth of, our, of the absoluteness of our faith. And for those that are weak in the faith, or nominal in the faith, as I'm saying, it could be a, a point of antagonism. This was Luther's concern and incited Luther to his ultimate powerful anti-Semitism that the Jews and the Talmud contained references to Jesus of a kind that were not only uncomplimentary but blasphemous. They have since been removed. But at that time, no Jew ever thought that a Gentile would be looking into the Talmud. But what happened in the Age of Enlightenment about the time of Luther was that many men were now studying Hebrew and were able themselves to read directly into the Jewish sources and see these anti-Christ references that have since been expunged. For example, if 
how could Jesus be born with an immaculate conception to a virgin? That's patent foolishness. Nothing in life or nature or reality can in any way sustain that. So the only way that reasonable men can explain such a birth and conception is that it must be illegitimate. And so the name Jesus was not used in the Talmud, but a name that the rabbis coined, and another name for Miriam as the one who bore him, making clear allusion that they understood that birth to be a piece of illegitimacy, and that the Christians had been duped to believe that that was some kind of hokey, no hands uh, miracle of a, um, uh, what's the word that was just used? Immaculate. Immaculate conception. Not knowing their own scripture, that unto us a child is born, unto us is given, a son is given. That's, that's the conclusion to which rational men will come when they themselves do not see the evidence in the, in the Gentiles around them of, of the reality as to the truth of that birth. So Luther saw the Jewish community as a dangerous threat to the Reformation, for even in their silence, they were making a testimony that they did not subscribe to the truth of the virgin birth of Jesus, and that the only alternative to that would be then to believe that he was illegitimate. Can you see the tension? That's why Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He knew that when we missed the day of our visitation and, and our peace, that this would necessarily follow. The destruction of our temple, the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, and the casting out into the nations of this Jewish people who would always be an awkward, untoward presence in their Gentile midst hmm. and would always excite envy, resentment, bitterness, suspicion and bring upon their heads periodically, particularly in the Easter season when the cry of Christ killer would come, Jewish death. You know, in the Middle Ages, Jews were compelled to attend debates between the local priest and the rabbi over the issue of the truth of Christ. And if they dared fall asleep, they were poked with long poles to keep awake, that in the hearing of this debate, uh, it would be straightened out for them. You need to understand the, what's the word? Invidious, unhappy uh, position that they occupied, which was part of the judgment of the rejection of Christ himself, but nevertheless had to be born without explanation. You know about the Crusaders on their way to the Holy Land, exploiting and pillaging every Jewish community en en route in order to provide, through terror and intimidation, the finances by which their expedition could be made. In the town that I loved in Germany more than any other, Esslingen, that it looks like it goes back to the Middle Ages to this day, it's never been touched by either World War, cobblestone streets, the old rat house, the city hall. The church in, in Esslingen was originally Catholic and is now Protestant, but it stands on the very place where the synagogue had stood that was burned to the ground. And in one of the uh, episodes of the Crusaders passing through, where the Jews for safety locked themselves in their synagogue. And seeing that, the Crusaders brought the whole community to its death in flames. So the fires of the Holocaust had an earlier inception in the Middle Ages, and Jews remember that. When you go to, when you go to Esslingen now, and there's the literature of the, of the tourist agency, of the bureaus, there's not a word about the history of Jews that goes back uh, into the 12th century. I only found it by accident that uh, as a student after coming out of the army, there's a reference to Esslingen and what had taken place uh, during the time of the Crusades. And often the threat was convert or die. What we're going to convert to this this mock thing, this travesty, this sacrilege, this paganism that celebrates a, a, a woman and her child, which goes back to the pagan myths uh, of earliest uh, history. Never. 
we, we prefer death. Mm. How is that death affected? By the husband and father killing his own children, cutting the throat of his wife, and then taking his own life. That when the doors burst open and the, and the raging Gentile, quote, Christian community came in, the whole Jewish community lay before them as dead. This is the history. You don't sweep that under the carpet. It's alive in Jewish memory. And so, that how is God going to bridge that in the last days and bring some kind of communication between communities that have such a history of separation? So you can understand the contempt for the Goyim. Oh, they may be nice to me now, but it's only... When the going gets tough, or for any reason, uh, we will again be their victim. You have to understand the way in which Jews will look upon, quote, Christians, because the word Gentile and Christian to them is synonymous. And they can't distinguish between a nominal Christian, because what shall a Gentile be if he's not a Muslim, but a Christian? and those that are born again. I didn't see the distinction myself until my 34th and 35th years in that year's leave of absence from the teaching profession with a pack on my back outside of America and out into the nations being picked up by this strange people almost daily who I could not say were Gentile, neither could I say they were Jews. They were another species of mankind that I could not identify then and realize now they were born-again believers. Most Jews have not the privilege of contact or exposure to Christians of this kind so that with one brush they tar everyone who is not Jewish and is Gentile as being, quote, Christian. My mother could not understand why I could go to Germany and minister there. She herself would not put a foot in a Volkswagen because what is German is Christian and what has come from Germany has been our annihilation. We need to be conscious of this lest we come in like bulls in the china shop. Are you saved, brother? That's all I needed to hear at that time, and I would be a dead man today. Mm. If someone had come at me with any uh, John 3.16 cliché, even though the Word of God is true, when you quote it as a convenience and it is not inspired by the Spirit in a moment of confrontation with anyone, Jew or Gentile, it becomes a cliché. It's a dead word. It antagonizes rather than quickens. So you have to be eminently the man of the Spirit or the woman of the Spirit to speak the right word. And don't think that if you're quoting a scripture that that is necessarily the right word if the Lord himself in his wisdom is not calling for that particular word. You may say something else of, of another kind that will surprise you and even offend you, as I have had occasion to speak to Jews. Like that man who wanted to have lunch with me, who had the reputation of being a disputer and a debater, and he was going to show that my whole faith was a fallacy, a, a businessman and a big shot, I forgot in what community in Tennessee, who flew in as the big executive and we had lunch together with a number of Christians and he was blabbing all the way blah 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 and I didn't say a word finally he said aren't you going to say anything I said well now that you ask I want you to know this is the most expensive lunch I have ever eaten and I forgot what, what followed it was an insult and I left him with that on another occasion, with a Jewish lawyer that was, had been brought by his Christian wife to hear me and uh, listened with disgust and was standing in the hallway as I left the church with his face like a mask of scorn, he ended up in the same restaurant where I was taken. And when I saw him at the table, I took my plate, knife, and fork, and I went over and I sat by him. And then he went on to persuade me of what an exemplary man he is, how he gives to charity, and if God is God, surely you'll have no fault with him because he's full of good deeds and so on. And I forgot how I said it. I said, dear brother, so long as I have breath in my body, I will persuade you that unless you forsake your self-righteousness and call upon the name of the Lord, you shall surely perish. But what he said was, can't we take hands and shake hands 
and that you will maintain, keep your conviction, I'll keep mine. I said, never. So long as you remain in your conviction, you'll be, you will eternally perish. And I walked away and left there with that charge. So uh, these are just illustrations of how and what God will say when God is saying. And I praise God that the man whose word pierced my heart in German, being picked up as a hitchhiker, and taking me into a, a German inn for something to eat because he was remarkably touched that he picked up a Jew. And I didn't even know why I divulged that when he picked me up after I'd been standing for three hours in the rain and took my filthy wet rucksack and threw it in the back seat of his car without any awareness that I was doing damage to his upholstery. And we drove off and he looked at me and said, why are you traveling like this? I was not a kid. It was not the tour season. Oh, I said, I'm a modern man whose life is broken at its foundations. I'm seeking for the deepest answers to life. And I'm Jewish. I don't know why I threw that in. And I turned to look to see this guy turned off and that I had regrettably given him a piece of information that was not necessary to excite his Gentile resistance. And the guy was beaming. The fact that I was Jewish was just for him something of enormous a moment. It's like the shoemaker in that town in Transylvania, Romania, humble believer whose one prayer was, Lord, give me one Jew before I die. Let me be your instrument in witnessing to one Jew who might be saved. And in course of time came, uh, what's his name? Richard Von Brand. Richard Von Brand, Jewish atheist, Marxist, like me. And this, this uh, shoemaker, in his simplicity, talking to this erudite Jew, uh, began to witness to him and gave him a New Testament and, and began to pierce him as the New Testament came into my hand also in a moment of time. And Wurmbrand takes the New Testament to a rabbi uh, to, to, to get this, the, the scoop on this, and the rabbi himself reading it for the first time and rubbing his beard says, the shame, Yiddish for how beautiful. Shem becomes in Yiddish shame. The shame, the shame, as he's reading for the first time these scriptures, by which Wurmbrand ultimately was converted, became the great godly man that he was, suffered for such a faith, being a missionary to the Jews in uh, Romania, and then having to face 13 years in solitary confinement and much torture, and then blessing the church after his release about what it means to follow Christ. Began with a shoemaker. Began with a man who picked me up off the side of the road and said, hey, let's stop and have a bite. <laughs> Who's not offended by the fact that I'm a Jew. And <laughs> over, the, over this table, I'm pouring out to this man my deepest soul. Things that I've not shared with closest friends, my mother, <clears throat> then wife, or anyone, I'm sharing with a Gentile stranger. Of all of the vexation of my heart, of, the, of a world that is teeter-tottering into... Uh, atomic and moral holocaust and there's no answer no, I've been a Marxist I've been this and that it's not going to save us I'm wondering why I'm pouring out these things of despair and hopelessness and the man is not just hearing me waiting to jump on me with John 3.16 mm -hmm. his hearing of me as I've often said was an act of love I had never been so heard that's what was drawing my heart out was the way in which I was being heard not a man waiting his moment of opportunity <coughs> to put a notch in his belt his hearing was an act of love. And finally, when it drew out my fullest heart, there was nothing more to say. I'd come to the end. I looked at this guy. Nothing at all conspicuous to look at, like the church itself. Thinking to myself, what is he going to say to me? Berkeley grad, a graduate of Marxist institutes, a traveler, reader, nothing new under the sun. And he looked up and he said to me in a quiet voice, Are you saved, brother? If he had said that, I would have died. He said, Art, what the world needs, because I was speaking to him, my anxiety for the world and its collapse and hopelessness, Art, he said, what the world needs is for men to wash one another's feet. When I heard that, I went down. To encourage your hearts, I sat there with my arms folded over my chest. My face still showed cynical resistance, but my inner man, the human spirit, was so pierced through by that one statement, 
It went on the floor and was whimpering. I had never heard wash one another's feet. But in the hearing of it, because it was the word of the Lord that was sent, it was not a cliche, something broke in me, and I pictured the arrogant hotshots of the world like Art Katz, who are going to save the world with rivers of blood like Karl Marx and all of the things that I've issued out of our Jewish determination to bring causes, <coughs> that the world would be saved not by causes, but by humility, by men bowing to wash the feet of another. And the first thing I thought was, teachers washing the feet of their administrators. Because my last statement at the faculty meeting at the high school in California was, we need a revolution against the, 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 uh, the system, the, the, the enemy, the, the administrators versus the teachers, the children versus their parents, the white versus the black, the, uh, the Palestinian versus the Israel, the Israeli. So everywhere you look, there's division, strife, enmity, and death. And when he said, wash one another's feet, never having read that, I broke and thought, Eureka, it's a spirit of humility that will save the world. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, the man began to speak to me the gospel in German. And I wanted to resist and say, hey, that's not for me. I'm Jewish. That's your book. We have ours. Not that I knew what ours was. <laughs> But the word of truth was coming forth into my inner man, and I could not turn from it. I left that building that day like a drunken sailor. I was staggered. I was overwhelmed by that confrontation that came by the Spirit through a sent word. Or else I would be dead today. That set in motion my salvation, because a man stopped who was godly and not ruled by cliches or the necessity to put a notch in his belt who could both hear with the hearing of God in love and speak the truth in love. And I've tried to find that man. I had his name and address. I knew something about him. He was a bookkeeper. He was in the church choir. He knew about architecture. He knew about art. He knew about uh, intellectual things. He was impressive. And my first day in Egypt, I was picked up and had lost my wallet with his name and address. Lost it. And every time I've been back to that area in Switzerland, many times, I keep asking the, the believers, I've now ceased from asking, do you know a man by the name of Richard? He works in a car agency, he's the bookkeeper, he sings in a choir, he's this, he's that. No one has ever heard of, of, of a Richard. Maybe I've not found anybody who in fact knows him. Or, there is no Richard, per se, as a man, and that I was picked up by an angel. <coughs> And we ought to at least be alive to that possibility that unless we are angels and that Jews cannot distinguish whether it's a man who has encountered us or an angel, we have come to the place of God's intention. Wow. And we're not speaking as men out of conventional wisdom or out of a cliched collection of appropriate verses, but the word of the Lord as it is mediated from heaven because only God knows the heart of that one to whom we have been brought. Wow. So our task is to move from men to angels so to become angelic. How many Christians are willing to be inconvenienced uh, to, to suffer the process by which we are brought from one to the other? We are only too content with our present condition. And if it were not for those Jews, we might well be satisfied with it. But they make a requirement of a kind that shapes us. And why should we be that for them? What did they ever do for us? but threaten the world by their intransigence and their stubbornness, unwilling to negotiate and give up a little land, blah, 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 blah. It's a rare Christian who can rise above that, and not echo that, and be willing for whatever the cost would be. So another factor is the miracle of the state of Israel itself and that has been sustained for half a century, giving every reason to expect it will yet remain, though I don't expect that myself, raises questions that, is God with them in their present condition? Maybe they don't need to be saved if God is favoring that nation and has <coughs> caused it to be and yet maintains it. In the um, interfaith dialogue between Jews and Christians, the condition that Jews require in order to participate 
is that the Christians recognize the validity of Judaism, that they're not coming to use the occasion of interfaith dialogue to convert, that Judaism is as valid as Christianity. And the Christian theologians that participate have accepted those terms. That's a remarkable concession, in my opinion. Why have they moved from Jew evangelism to the Jew to dialogue around the table? Because the Holocaust raises the question of the issue of the church and its audacity now to, to call Jews to conversion after it has been the principal architect of the, of the Holocaust. It's a guilt out of the Holocaust as somehow being a statement of Christian bankruptcy that has moved the church, the mainline church, from being an instrument of evangelism to moving toward uh, idea, uh, uh, dialogue around the table on the grounds that Judaism is valid. It's something that, that Paul would never have con uh, conceded, but the church has, and it's a remarkable weakening, not only in its relationship with the Jew, but its presence in the world. It has weakened its own knowledge of the gospel and the boldness with which it needs to be promulgated because it makes this concession. So you might think I'm talking out of two sides of my mouth. That I'm on one hand I'm appealing for an empathy and a pathos and an identification with the Jews. And at the other hand I'm saying no compromise on the issue of the gospel. But the gospel remains a non-issue until it can be presented in a way that is, bears the sense of Christ to those who have been historically turned off against it. That's our, that's our tension. That's our staggering predicament. And it will require us to become saints to pass through it. We cannot, in our present condition, break through in this historical obstruction, except that we come to a condition of an ultimate kind to which we would not have come if they were not present to us as the issue of God's requirement. If only they would disappear, then we would be freed from the, the issue of the cross and our suffering to become angelic. I'm going to be reading tonight or tomorrow something from Basileia Schlink on the Bride of Christ. And she makes the whole issue of the identity of the Bride of Christ, the issue of the cross, the issue of suffering. Nothing else will shape the character of the church to be adorned for the bridegroom. And that suffering might well come to us most profoundly in our identification with this Jewish people. Not only a suffering with them and from by them because of their defensive resistance, but also the world's <coughs> enmity against us if we side with the people whom the world despises. Just, just like those who went to the concentration camps like Corrie ten Boom, for their identity with Jews, we too will face that persecution. So if their state has survived 50 years without Christ, maybe we need to think twice. Do they have a place uh, of validity that does not require our gospel? And is our gospel really uh, uh, the absolute requirement that we think it to be? If they seem to exist and prosper uh, so without it. Other factors like the moral and ethical superiority of family and community life appears to exceed our own. They seem to be prospering without Christ more than we who have Christ. And the answer to that question is this. The devil is not in any way troubling them about their sanctity. He wants to allow them to presume that they are in a place of superiority and moral uh, acceptability even to God by virtue of their works and their own uh, composure and ethical and moral behavior. Once they become believers, then they'll, have, they'll enter the conflict between flesh and spirit that only a born-again believer knows. But while you're outside that faith, the, uh, the enemy will allow you to think yourself not only acceptable, but exemplary. And so they, they exhibit, a, like the Mormons, a moral quality of life that moves us to envy and even raises the question, are we so right in our presumption when their moral conduct and ethical concern exceeds our own? So all of these are factors 
that would affect Gentile Christians in their attitude and relationship to our Jews unless we understand these things and can rise above them and that we, that we are not chafed by their air of superiority but rather have a sense of anguish and pathos because we know it's an illusion and that in the day of the Lord when they pass from this life there will be a shock of horror that what they lived in and congratulated themselves by was a deception and it's too late now to remedy or to correct we know that for all lost persons and it ought to be a, an anguish that underlies our relationship with them and enables us to bear their hostility and their superiority without ourselves being adversely affected Is, uh, am I coming through? does that make sense? if we don't have that that sense of eternal loss as Paul had it in the cry that he sounds at the commencement of the three great chapters of Romans 9-11 through 11, that he would wish himself a curse for his brethren's sake how could the rest of Romans 9-11 through 11 have been expressed? it had to begin first by a note of the deepest anguish of soul for the lostness of his own kinsmen according to the flesh mirroring and echoing the cry of Jesus himself on his way to the cross looking over Jerusalem and weeping over the city how often would I have taken you under my wings as a hen or chicks but you would not and now you have missed the day of your visitation and the day of your peace the question is have we come to that weeping have we come to that anguish do we uh, have an empathetic heart for the sorrow and the tragedy of Jewish history and Jewish present condition even when it's untroubled let alone that which they will soon face if we come to them clinically and correctly without a pathos of identification like unto Paul's they'll not heal us and even our best intentions will fail and our words will be brittle and mechanical something more will be required and it's in that requirement that we are fitted to be bride for the, brides for the bridegroom because the bridegroom himself is full of pathos full of empathy, full of sympathy, full of compassion, full of mercy to those who are undeserving mercy has nothing to do with the, with the um, those for whom the mercy is given it's not a response to their virtue it's solely the expression of the one who extends it it's all the more mercy because it's undeserving <clears throat> easy for us to extend sympathy and mercy to those who have some quality that endears itself to us but to those that are abrasive, hostile, offensive, unpleasant that, that would be the mercy of God and the, how does Romans 11 end? that by your mercy they may obtain mercy if we have not a mercy to extend and it's only doctrinal and correct as a category of our faith and is not an experiential and existential reality in us formed by God in the school of the cross what shall we have to extend the Jew raises the issue of the truth of our life in Christ the truth of our sanctity and that is the mystery and the wisdom of God we can go on the fear of Zionist conspiracy to take over the world what, what is that publication of the protocols of Zion have you ever heard of it? that I think was published first in Russia in mid 1800s that Jews have correctly identified as a fraud a thing to further anti-Jewish persecutions that describes a conspiracy of Jews worldwide to take over that comes out of a warped thing of God's own intention that Israel and redeemed Jewry will be central to all nations that when God established the number, number of nations he did so in accordance with the number of the sons of Israel there is an instinctive fear and suspicion on Gentiles that Jews will take over the world yes. hey look how prominent they are they're bankers, they're in media, they're in communication they make the movies, they write the books they shape our mind and thought and they, they have something together that's unspoken that we, of which we need to be suspicious a rumor was circulated that rabbis were telling the Jewish community of New York do not be present in the trade towers 
on September 11th. <laughs> for it's a conspiracy that of which we are engaged to bring those towers down to set in motion certain anti-Islamic elements that will serve our purpose. So be absent that day from work. You know that there are hundreds upon hundreds of thousands who believe that? It raises the question of why is it that Gentiles are so quick and so susceptible to believe a rumor of that kind? Because they want to. Because they have already been prepared for. Because they already have an instinctive suspicion. Because there's something about Jews and their clannishness and their identity together that, that would make such a, a suspicion viable. You, you think that that's a fit message to begin a conference? And, and that I would be taken aside in a room on the next day and be interrogated by the leaders and be accused of lacking anointing and uh, uh, needing a deeper circumcision of the heart because I spoke in this way. They didn't like the subject. And I went on with the same subject for three messages. <laughs> so that when it ended and on my way out of the, uh, the building and into the parking lot, I was accosted by the worship leader with whom I was in a continual tension all through those days. He said, if anyone came speaking like you about Indians or Mexicans or black people, I would be completely turned off against any of them. And now because you have made that your sole subject, I'm completely turned off against Jews. I'm a liberal man and I'm tolerant with everyone and I don't need to have any particular special empathy. Uh, and what are Jews? Are they something special in themselves? Brother, if you are a brother, his exact words. What antagonized that man so? Because of the repetition of the subject beginning in this way. But before my next message, after having been critiqued by these men as needing a deeper circumcision of heart and wanting an anointing, a brother came up to me and said, I want you to, and not knowing what had taken place privately, I want you to know, Art, that your first message pierced me through altogether. And at the end of that message, the woman cried out, I have been ripped off. She cried, I have been ripped off. Where has this been all my life? I had no consciousness of these things at all, is what she was saying. And her husband across the room pointed me, you can't leave us like this. You can't raise a subject like this and leave us suspended. That came out of this statement, accused by those who were in leadership, that somehow it was wanting anointing. Well, I wish you could have seen me sitting there. I looked like a smug Cheshire cat having just lapped up a plate of cream. I'm listening to these men. I'm not at all convicted. I, of course, I have a naive belief that what I spoke was given of God. That he himself was the, the, the author of my visiting to that Spokane synagogue and tempering and setting uh, something in my spirit to make this a first statement, not knowing what the second statement would be or the end, but to begin with this. And so I'm listening to these men. I, I'm re polite, respectful. I'm willing to acknowledge that, yes, who doesn't need a deeper circumcision of the heart and breaking, hmm. but at the same time, naively confident that I have been obedient to speak what the Lord has wanted, <coughs> and that these men somehow were not able to hear it. Why, could, why, why is that that one man came and said, I was pierced through, mm -hmm. and hearing the same word. I, I said, it's strange that you should say that. How could you have been pierced through if the word was not anointed? Mm -hmm. So um, it's a good question, because it gives us a clarity on what this prophetic call is. In your moments of greatest obedience, you're going to be misunderstood, misconstrued, and accused. Not by the world, but by the church, and not by the church at large, but the finest and best expression of it, and in the last analysis, even those from within your own fellowship. Are you willing to bear that? There's a prophetic tension and a prophetic suffering and a prophetic anguish. And even though you have prayed and the Lord has given you this, so rarely do I write anything like that, that, I'm, that I would speak from notes like this. This is a remarkably unusual, maybe because it was so perilous, maybe because it's so new, striking a note like that. These men didn't invite me to Canada to speak on this. They thought they were going to hear the old art. 
messages of a kind that they can say yay and amen that's in keeping with the church as the central purpose of God and the restoration etc etc they got something else of an entirely other kind but it was not for them alone the Lord was using that conference as a platform to bring to the church at large a statement and a theme and a note that was being struck for a first time and they didn't want to be the auspices they wanted what was accessible and convenient and appropriate to what they wanted to enjoy. One man who was one of the leaders said to me, we had prayed before you came, Art, that the Lord would stretch us uh, unbearably and break new categories of understanding that would even seem to threaten what we have already understood. I said, you dear man, the Lord has heard your prayer and answered it far more than you know. <laughs> So I end asking the question, who then, being Gentile, is not susceptible to an inevitable antagonism or a secret envy toward this Jewish people? Yeah. Who is not susceptible? Mm. Who does not have an underlying suspicion or antagonism? And maybe the first order of business is the acknowledgement of that possibility. We may never have had an occasion to express it, but that doesn't take away from its presence. It's latent until it's recognized and confessed and given up and broken. So, let's have a little prayer at this point and see how the Lord will, will follow from this. Gracious God, remember how we spoke at the first? that you will give us opportunity to critique the recent experience in Canada. Not to exalt ourselves, or to see good guys and bad guys, but to understand a, a prophetic event in its constituent elements. They were classic, and will always accompany any obedience to which a prophetic person or church is called. And we have got to know it, my God, and to be fit and to be prepared for it. And also to sense what you're saying what you're wanting the church to recognize, what depth must, of real breaking must come in the heart, what ironic circumcision must come in the heart of the man who, who said to me, you need this, when what he's saying, not realizing it, is prophetic. It's the church that needs a deeper circumcision of heart. It's the church that needs a deeper breaking. And what will be the more likely provision to provoke that breaking than the deep awareness that however uh, our life has been used of the Lord and, and is for the Lord, there is still the prospect of something in our deeps that we have never been called to consider that needs to be recognized as a final obstruction to the full possession of the Lord and the expression of his son of David character to a people who have never seen him so expressed. And that though we would say, me, anti-Semitic? No way, God, I never would ever... Uh, hurt or physical abuse but this is so deep it does not need that expression even the resistance to the message can itself be that expression so Lord teach us, instruct us deal with us you're wanting something new, there's a new wine reserved for the last days that is the best of all but it must have a container supple and yielded to receive it and so we ask that even as I'm speaking like a fool, not even knowing how to proceed further, that somehow you're not only speaking but dealing. Come, precious God, give us a heart like unto your own, as Paul the Apostle had, that distinguishes him as an Apostle and might well be the very critical feature that makes an Apostle an Apostle, is the heart to this people, not because they are flesh and blood kinsmen, but they, because they are the brethren of the Lord. So, my God, work in our deeps, we pray. We thank you and give you praise for these privileged days. In Yeshua's holy name, amen.